Welcome, Carm Capriato, the Service Aftermarkets Podcast Pioneer with the gold standard of aftermarket business podcasts. Join me for aftermarket insights as we advance the aftermarket. And as always, know that you'll learn just one thing. Find us on your favorite podcast listening app and RemarkableResults.biz or on my YouTube channel. Hey, everybody. Carm Capriato. Good to have you here. Remarkable Results Radio. Hey, one more time, please let me remind you of breaksforbreasts.com, the great October initiative that we have that's been raising up to $1.8 million for the Cleveland Clinic and research for the triple negative breast cancer vaccine. So we're so proud to be part of that. And it's a constant reminder to you, go to breaksforbreasts.com, watch this most recent episode we did on actually how to do this. I am kind of thrilled. I've got a hell of a panel here with me. And I'll, and I'll tell you the story. Uh, it was uh, it was Tracy who actually put this thing together, guys. I mean, I didn't have to do a thing to pull you power guys together. It's amazing. It is. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. She did everything. <laughs> we didn't do anything at all. I know Tanner Brand is here, president, Auto Diag Clinic, LLC, trainer in the industry. He's been on. You've done a ton of great contributions to the podcast, Tanner. Thanks for being here. Oh, thanks for having me. And Michael Ingvardsen, global training manager, Nissens. Hello, Michael. Hello, Com. Thank you so much for having me. Appreciate it. All right. Yeah, so happy. Uh, I'll break the code. You you just heard a little bit of an accent. Uh, and I think if you've listened to the podcast and you've heard Michael come on a couple of times, Michael's from Denmark. It's 10 o'clock at night as we're recording this. If he dozes off, you'll understand why. <laughs> yeah, that's it. I mean, I almost dozed off just a few minutes ago. So that should be fine. Just waiting. Well, thanks. Listen, I've been on a big education kick lately. And when, uh, when Tanner and Michael and Tracy were talking about automotive education, kind of let's do a review of it. I'm a big fan of this because we can't improve enough of what we have guys and we can't help kind of push the entire educational piece internal or through our educational systems and before i start and jump into this and tanner you've got some great points to make about high school and college just recently something came up and i was talking about the word education versus training because i think you both know i'm this big proponent for a language shift in the industry and every time I bump across something, I said, my God, that's powerful. That would make us so much more professional to the outside world and internally. And I was thinking of training. And I, as I said that, someone said to me, but Carm, training is about being in the moment. And education is about long-term knowledge gain. And I thought about that for a minute. And, and guys, just work with me. There's an individual in the shop and something just happened. Or there was this moment of learning that could have happened with one of my people. I go in and I say, hey, let's do some mini training. Here, here's what happened. Here's what could have happened. Here's an option. Here's this or that. And it really wasn't an educational dump. It was almost like a training dump. But when I go to a conference or I, you know, or I do a video, you know, a, a lunch and learn, that's an educational thing. What say you, Tanner, on that concept? Yeah. So I think when you're looking at doing like training with lunch and learns or any type of college training or I guess Harvard, like Harvard Business School, something like that is a long term process, has multiple steps to it, multiple classes to it. Trying to kind of think through what you're going to do, how you're going to do it and how you're going to plan it out is a lot different than well, I'll call just in time training. So something popped up and you see an opportunity to just quick show somebody and say, hey, yep. you know, we can do this better. These are what you could do. But it's not something that's laid out a course of action or a, what I want to say, long-term learning schedule. So I guess I would say that both are good, but you have to think about uh, what you're trying to accomplish with yeah, each. It, the training is in the moment. And I think we need to say, I'm, I'm going for training. No, I'm going for education. And and again, I don't want to belabor that because we got a lot of great things to talk about. But what say you, Michael? 
Well, I, th I think we got to be careful. And, and we have to remember that things are very different in Europe than they are in the US. It's very difficult to drag people into a training class in Europe because they want to spend time with their family. When they work, they work. When they come home, they want to go to a training class. And we cannot get them into a training room on a weekend. It is impossible. It's vice versa in the US. <laughs> we can get evening training class. We can actually get them in the training room or education room, whatever you want to call it, on a Saturday, Sunday. And that, that, that concept is a little bit different. So for me, training in Europe is very much short, short term where we have to be really spot on when we do the training class in Europe because we only have three hours on a Wednesday night. Whereas when I go to the US and do training classes, I just came back last weekend where I did training class in Atlanta and Fort Lauderdale. We have them for four hours and it could be eight hours. I can lay it out a little bit longer, but again, we only have them for that one day. But you're absolutely right. We got to be careful that we don't limit our training to being just right here, just right now, and look at it sort of long-term saying, listen, this is just one part of what you're going to have to learn in the future. And you look have to look a little bit more uh, open-minded than just believe in what I say. You, know, you have to take what I say and use it on a daily basis based on what you do every day, basically. It's so refreshing, Tanner, to have Michael on with us because we get a chance to hear what's going on in Europe and how so different across the pond is in society and, and let me just set this up front here so it doesn't come out later how many weeks of vacation do you get in denmark we have seven i mean hello <laughs> uh, we have tanner, well, what would well, you do with seven weeks tanner right now i mean i just took a week off last week and that's the most i've taken in a long time so seven See? weeks i i could do a lot Wow. <laughs> I, I would travel to Denmark. That's probably what I would do. I'm told M Michael tells me that at Christmas time, it's really nice there. So mm, it is. <laughs> <And> cold. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I bet you it's cold. All right. Hey, let's jump into this whole educational automotive educational thing. Tanner high school. What do you see? I mean, God, we, I've done a lot of shows on this and you know, BOCES is the name of the New York state grouping where they have a school and then multiple high schools send their people in for all the different skilled trades. We call it the Board of Cooperative Educational Services. And I actually have a daughter-in-law that works in it, not in the automotive space, but in, in supporting challenged children at BOCES. It's a great system. Just did a tour of it. I mean, uh, we were in two automotive shops at, a, at this particular center. They had the latest equipment I've ever seen. Yeah. So I attended a uh, bow season for those of you that are not in New York, it may be like considered a vocational center, but it's considered or called bow season in New York. And it's a, I would say technical career education path. They're really just a career education path because there's things that I wouldn't consider technical education. There's a nursing program, there's cosmetology, things like that, but it gives students a opportunity to uh, take part of their day when they're in high school, their junior and senior year, and attend a career center and take classes that are typically away from their home school. So typically it's set up for a entire county. So several schools that are in that county will attend one BOCI. So not only do the kids get the opportunity to go to the center, but then they also get to the opportunity to meet other kids around in their uh, local area that they might not through their normal school. Tanner, Tanner, I got to stop you for a moment. Do you think the shop owners in the U.S. know to go knock on that door and say, hey, I got to talk to you about what we do. And here's the reason, the biggest push that we need to do this is when we were talking to one of the instructors, there's a whole bunch of independents, swoped down. They, they actually cooked us breakfast. We went in, we shared what we were doing. They learned more about our local college. We got a tour of the place. We're hanging out in the shop. And of course, the shop teacher looked at us as if we were mom and pops and there's not a lot of money to be made and there's not a lot of training that's available in the independent world. And they were shocked about it. We need to go get that message out because we're missing opportunities for apprenticing and to even send them off to the two-year school. And my, my challenge is, is that the shop owners today have to do this. We have to. I'm on around six advisory boards, probably, accumulatively. And the shop owners most of the time never know. And if they do know about the centers, I would say not only just BOCES, but career centers, because now I'm in South Carolina, we have career centers here. And 
even if they do know about it, typically they don't know a ton about the program other than that the program exists. I get a lot of pushback about, well, the kids don't come out and they're, the kids don't come out ready for the career, which my argument is always in two years, nobody's going to be ready for any career at that point. I really don't care what career it is. I don't think two years is enough time to learn it, especially automotive. Uh, if we look at just ASE's eight subjects, those eight subjects have been around since the 70s, but now we have ADOS, we have hybrid, we have EV, and then one that I've been bringing up lately that people don't even think about is the infotainment systems that are connecting with Apple CarPlay or Android Auto in the problems that those present, and that's essentially having to understand computer or understanding apps, and that's a whole nother thing. So we've kept those eight areas for two years, but then we've added all of this other stuff. So there's no way that in two years, anybody can learn all of that. But I had talked, I guess I want to quick bring up how this kind of, this idea came to be and why I made Michael do this at 10 PM is a couple of years ago, Michael and I had sat down, I think we were at max and I grilled yeah. him about what education was like in Denmark for not just automotive, but as a whole, what the difference was in how students were able to see or get into career paths versus how we did it in the U S. So Michael, what does that look like? Is there BOCES, is there vocational centers, things like that? Oh yeah, there is. But you have to remember the whole setup is different. I mean, every you have to remember that the whole approach that we have to education is different because everybody is basically equal. So everybody has equal rights from uh, you're born to until you turn 25 or 30, until you are graduated from whatever you've chosen. So anybody can go to any school as long as you have the right grades. Okay, so we don't, and when once you graduate, people don't care which school you come out of. As long as you graduated, you have the same level as the ones that graduated in Copenhagen, where I live, which is the capital that lives 300 kilometers away and four kilometers from it, and so on. So we're very lucky it is that way. The approach is also that we want to keep people creative. We don't want to lock them into a specific uh, topic and say, this is how things are done. You have to do this way. No, we're always creative. Look at it like Lego. We always build these different Legos and different shapes and forms and colors and everything else, but everything has to fit together. And of course, there is a separation once you get into when you turn 16, 17, you need to pick another school, another education. Of course, if you don't have the right grades, you can't get in. But there's always a loophole. There's always a way around it. And I'm a proof of that because I didn't get good grades in school because I can't sit still and I don't want to go to school, which is kind of stupid when I'm a trainer. So, but anyway, yeah, it doesn't make any sense. But then again, to the loophole saying, okay, I'm not going to go this way, which is the right way to be a trainer or be a technical trainer. Well, I'm going to go around it through other training programs, and I'm still in the same place as I would have been if I went to the straight path. I just did way more normal labor, so to speak. But we're also very lucky in Denmark that we actually get paid to go to school. We actually get a thousand dollars a month before taxes to go to school so that you do not have to go and have a job. Well, you don't have to work that much to actually support you while you go to school. And this you can have for five years. So even if I suddenly, when I'm 50 now, and turn out that, hey, I want to go back to school, I can still get five years of state supported education. So, okay. Yeah, I, I, it begs the question. Good. It begs the question, Tanner. Wow. <laughs> Okay, if you get a thousand bucks a month pre-tax, <laughs> what's it cost to go to school in Denmark? Yeah, I mean, is it is hey, it a the, wash? The, is, no, it's, it's no, it doesn't because it doesn't cost everybody. anything to go to a college to learn nope, any particular. Nothing, nothing. So everything, I mean, everything is free in Denmark. I mean, who, who pays the taxes? Well, we do. I mean, this, <laughs> well, I do. I, I, I guess. Well, that's what it says in my paycheck. I do pay taxes. Unfortunately, ah. I pay 50 percent in taxes. So, but you have to remember that. And, and this is where it becomes a cultural thing and not so much what I think is right or wrong. It doesn't really matter. You have to remember that we, we're sort of a socialist country where we believe in everybody should have equal rights. But that also means that everybody needs to support it all the way through. You get your first job, pay taxes all the way through. You're retired for you. You pay the same when you're, if you have kids go to school and everything like we do in taxes. But once they're out of school, 
you're done. That's it. So it depends on what you believe in and how you're raised. That's remember that I, I don't think like an American and that's, it doesn't change anything except for the fact that our culture is just this way. So we believe in this system. I'm not saying one is better than the other. Uh, I'm just saying that's the way it is. I like Amazing. the one that we have, but because it's Amazing free, everybody has their rights. Michael, how many years do they go to high school? What is your high school? Like three ours years. is okay. So three years of high school yeah. starting, you know, like age wise that starts. Well, the, well, it's a little bit different because you got college, high school and everything. That's kind of a mix between when you go to school. So we got like from first till 10th grade, when you leave 10th grade, you're like 15, 16. Then you go into what you, what we would call sort of a mix between high school, college, university, whatever. So when you're 16 to 19, you go to that mix once you're done with that if that's what you choose you could also go in a different direction and be a carpenter be an auto mechanic or auto technician and then from that point on you want to maybe go to university or you want might want to be get a bachelor or whatever or you want to move to the states and get an exchange into an exchange program with the us that doesn't cost you anything either that's also supported by the Danish government because we pay taxes. So all these things, basically, until you are 30, you can go to school and not pay a damn thing. For automotive <laughs> students, this has got yeah. me thinking now. So like, say they turn 16 and they want to get into <laughs> automotive. What does that sure. career path look like for one of those students? They're going to be in school for four years and six months. Two years of that is going to be physical training, meaning being in a workshop. You have to go and apply at a workshop to be a trainee, so to speak. So two years is going to be out in the field doing real work, and two and a half years is going to be in school. That's where we enter the program, basically, by offering technical services to the school, because you have to remember that the schools are self-supported, sort of. They're 50% supported by the government and 50% self-supported. Yeah. So they need to find that information themselves. And this is where we get into trouble because if they can't buy that validated information anywhere, they have to rely on someone like us. And if I'm not a nice guy, I can f – no, no, but honestly, if I want to lie, I can lie and say, listen, we just developed this brand new thing and I'm just lying my ass off. And they're going to use that in their training material without anybody validating it, where they're going to validate it. I'm in a niche area, AC, heat pumps. That's a niche thing. And heat pumps are fairly new still. Who's going to validate whatever I say? Are you going to Google it hmm. or are you going to, yeah. You know, Tanner, I find this so interesting that you want to know this. Are you running for president? <laughs> no, uh. I don't know if they can pay me enough to run for president in this country. I just was Maybe. curious. I think it's very interesting, <laughs> the difference of education here versus there. Yeah, and It's then, a great point. It's a great point. But every other country in Europe does something different, right? I would say, so we talked with Dirk at one point, and that was yeah. very similar. And that's, yes. now Dirk went as far as talking about, like, driver's education, mm -hmm. and that typically when you get your license, there's a lot more to go through just to get your license than there is oh. to, you know, in the U.S. So your drivers, when they're coming into the repair shop, are also more educated than here. So it's just a very different thing. But overall, to me, looking at now, I guess to bring this further, is then into the training side. Is how does you know that relate to our training? So obviously, I went through BOSI's vocational, and then I got into the automotive training. I went through Toyota T10 College as well, so I saw that side of the training. So students here, if they go through BOSI's, they have two years in high school, and then they have the opportunity to go through two years of college. So what I see on the advisory boards is the shops saying, okay, well, why are students not educated after high school and don't really understand that, that was an intro and maybe we should be recruiting from the colleges or if we're recruiting from a vocational school that we have to understand that we should be either pushing them to go to college in automotive or pushing them to do continued education and that in Denmark, they have four years and they understand that there's four years of training. Hey, Apex 2024 registration is now open at aapexshow.com. Now, Apex has an incredible value for the service professional shop owner, technician, and service advisor. 
Joe's Garage is your place to hang out with 10 working bays and real live working conditions. You'll find special seminars on Audi, VW, BMW, Mercedes, Tesla, under the hood diagnostics, advanced drivability, ADAS calibration, transmission training from ATRA, and more. Business and sales training on mastering organizational skills, time management, leading your team, and driving profits, among others. This year, the training courses are some of the best offered ever with the industry's best and brightest trainers and coaches. This year's Apex 2024 will have more product demos, trending training, marketing and social media support to help you grow your career, sales, and profits. Remember, if you earn your living in the aftermarket, then Apex is the expo for you. Continue listening as we bring you the latest from Apex 2024 and save the date, November 5th through the 7th. Don't hesitate. Go to aapexshow.com. Hey, let's face it. Your shop management system is the single most important tool in your shop, period. Napa Tracks has made selecting the right shop management system easy by offering the industry's best, most comprehensive SMS. Now, it all starts when a local representative meets with you to learn about your business and how you need to run it. After all, it's your shop, so it's your choice. And having local representation is a huge plus. Customizing tracks to your business, whether you're a one-person shop or a large multi-bay or multi-location company, a representative consults with you to help optimize your shop's workflow, efficiency, and profitability. Tracks always has the flexibility to do business how you need to do it, which means it can also grow as your business grows. And unlike the other guys, we'll be there for you after installation with the best training and support in the business. Yes, a learning management system tailored to each role in your company. Simply put, Trax was designed and built for shop owners just like you. Visit us on the web at Napa Trax, that's N-A-P-A-T-R-A-C-S dot com. Hey, ever wonder how your labor rate compares to your market and state? You now have a site where you can confidentially upload your rate and see other labor rates published in your market. LaborRateTracker.com is an important site to know about. Currently, the database has over a thousand shops participating and growing every day. But there's more to setting your rates than finding out what others charge. You should look at the labor rates in your state and town to gain a complete picture of the labor rate landscape. Hey, it's easy. Get market intelligence like never before at LaborRateTracker.com. I got to throw something in here. It's burning. Internships and apprentices can be a result of the couple of years worth of vocational in high school. They could be in, actually interning at a shop while they're going to school and then come out if we have an official apprentice program going on inside of our building business. They don't have to go to college, but if they do, they can still go out and intern during that time, come back in, do the apprentice program and start working on ASEs. There's, I think there's career pathways ways here. And I just think we're too lazy to re reach out and figure it out. Yeah. It, and look at too, like Michael was just saying, now Nissan is supporting their schools. How many companies do you know here that are actively supporting schools? I know shops that are, and I have people on the advisory boards from companies like Nissan's and others, but they're typically there still to sell them something. So they're not really supporting them. So look at the difference, you know, what can be learned just from that one thing. There's industry is supporting the schools there and then understanding that it's not a six month support thing, a two month support thing. It's a continually ongoing support network for the schools to then help down the road, get them in shops. And then that's when the companies are finally going to see a return is the students are hopefully going to buy those parts or whatever, but it's a long-term solution where I feel like everything in the U S with automotive education is so transactional and short-term let's look at, I'm going to, I don't want to wow. throw names out there, but looking at some of the colleges that are six month programs, we have a six month program in comparison to other countries knowing that it's a four year program. Now there are four year programs that you can take here in the U S but there's so many that get the majority of mainstream media coverage or marketing that are a six-month program. 
I'm blown away by the word transactional, Tanner. It, I think it's important. I think we, we really need to discuss this. And do you mean by transactional is it's really hands off? There's no relationship there or it's quick and fast? I would say both. You pay an amount of money and you go to school. If you do good and you know get everything you can out of it, maybe you'll turn out okay. If you go and you don't care and you fail, that's on you. However, some of the hmm. programs you may or may not get what you pay for. I mean, there's programs that are some of the shorter term programs that are crazy money that I know some of the people teaching at them. I know the curriculum being taught at them. Sometimes there's smaller schools that are cheaper with better instructors. You know, here's a good, and, and that's a great question for both Michael and you. Where's our current instructor base getting educated? That's yeah. Michael, well, I mean, I, 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 yeah, I can only say from, from our perspective, because when we started in CC and training concept, one of the ideas or one of the purposes was to give something back to the industry. How do you do that? Through technical school, through the trainers. So what I do, and I'm actually leaving at five o'clock in the morning to go to a, a technical school in Denmark, where we share our material for free. They get everything for free, they get all the technical stuff, all the technical bulletins, everything they want, they get that for free. We don't ask them to write nissons on there. We ask them to use it if they can use it. But what we also do, we offer them training classes to come either to nissons or we go to them. So we say, listen, I mean, this is the newest thing. I have to remember that I'm not part of sales. I'm part of the training class. One of the things that I said to our CEO when I started doing the NCC or being responsible for this was that, I'm not part of sales. I'm part of technical training classes and I'm part of everything that happens in the industry. Anything new that comes out there, new compressors, new condensers, new machines, new O-rings, whatever. I need to talk about it, whether we produce it or not. I need to know exactly what it does. That's why I'm leaving for the US next week to do testing on oil. I need to know what's out there in the market to use it for technical training classes and give back to the industry. I mean, we're mooching off it. That's a bad word, but we're living off. The, yeah, it, it's a bad word, but we're living off the industry industry okay we're living off the workshops we need to give something back to make sure well you're just stupid because the compressor broke. yeah because the technicians are idiots yeah but what are you giving back to them so they are not idiots well this is what we're giving back and we're offering these training classes and all the material on the website or wherever and there's tons of information out there the problem is really how do we validate it? How, can we use Max to validate it? Can we use Mac Partners in Europe? Can we use VASA in Australia to validate the information? Because there's so much information out there. But unfortunately, the stories that I hear about different refrigerants or different oils is like, is this Christmas? Or is this, I mean, are you just making up these things just because you don't want to talk about the bad side of things? I mean, so we really got to be careful what we say during a training class as well. And this is what we're trying to get back to the industry. We also have some technical schools in the U.S. that ask for material. We give it to them. It's fine. I mean, just ask for it. We'll give it to you. You need it. And there's nothing secret about it. There really isn't. Do you know how they or what is required for the instructors in your area so like at a college is there continued education required for yeah. them th th there is unfortunately where do you get that MK, uh, education where do you get it you get it from me i mean you get it when you talk about ac that they, they call me when you talk about transmission they call cf when they call about i mean that's how they get educated or they go find it themselves online oh look at wikipedia talks about oil oh that's probably true Probably not. Or how do, again, how do we validate the information we're getting unless we go out there and say, listen, this is validated. We can prove this is validated information. So here you go. We have proof of everything that we say is correct. Whether it goes against us or works for us doesn't matter. Uh, that, that that doesn't matter to me. I'm here to tell you about the technical aspect of how an AC system or heat pump or compressor condenser works. It doesn't matter whether I'm from Nissan's of value or whomever. doesn't really, as long as it's true what I'm saying. Right. Karm, what are your thoughts with, I mean, you're on your local advisory board. Yep. What are your thoughts? I'm so in, everything you guys are saying, I can absolutely validate the challenges that we're having. But here's what's going on, which is very exciting at our college, is we're going from an AAS degree to an AOS. Okay. And the problem that we found in our AAS, which included English, science, and math, is that our young freshmen coming in weren't passing it. And unfortunately, in our school, it's a 
standalone facility away from where you've got to go get that special education piece and they weren't getting to school and and we found so many of our freshmen didn't have licenses so now we're getting ready to start driver training everything that we can to make up for some of the inadequacies in our students not that they have inadequacies but there are certain levels they haven't attained if you will right and wanting to yeah i really want to be an automotive technician english science and math it wasn't in their think so we were, they were failing out. Well, the Associates of Occupational Sciences, the AOS degree doesn't have that. So we replaced those curriculum pieces with labs. And then we decided because we could work the schedule smarter is that we would do the lecture and then the lab right after it. Because of the way the schedules were working, we were doing the lecture two days later, it was the lab. And so we got a brand new uh, a chairman of our department and he was really analyzing this you can't imagine what it took to get the AOS approved. It took about a year through the educational system up and down and up and down, finally to get it authorized that so we have. We're just starting it this fall, but we can't put everybody who's going and who's currently in their second year of AAS. It sounds crazy, but we're moving forward with a different kind of education. We're, we've got some grant money, Perkins grant money for EV stuff. We've got to get some training going on. I couldn't be happier with what's going on and the independents are jumping in heavy on the advisory board. We're doing a lot of interning. I'm happy with what's going on here in Western New York, but it doesn't mean it's working everywhere. And that's the reason we're talking about education. We're talking about this because if you can hear what Tanner's talking about and what Michael and myself, maybe there's a little bit of an ounce of motivation for you to get involved. Yeah, and what Carm just brought up, the AAS and AOS is, very interesting because I that was something that I had a lot of consideration when I went to school. So AAS is Associates in Applied Science, AOS is Associates in Occupational Science. And like Carm said, the difference is you don't have to take math, science, English, some of the other stuff. What that changes is if the student wants to go long term, say the student wants to start in automotive and then switch into engineering, typically those core classes are then needed in engineering so at some point if they take an aos degree they then have to get those credits elsewhere so if you're a student looking to go into a school make sure that you look at what you're getting and what your long-term goals are don't just think short term because that can affect how your credits transfer and what schools will take you so both degrees are good both degrees have their ups and downs Michael, this is another, I guess, thing that I want to ask is, do you know when they're in the colleges there, are they taking math, science, stuff like that? They do. They do. Certain different degree or certain levels. So, and they also, we had the same thing going on. If you need to go against a certain degree, you have to have a certain level of math or science or whatever. So it, it's not a huge issue because you just take it over two, three months and then you're done. And then you, you just apply again and then that's fine. And they'll, they'll support you in doing that. So, and have to remember that from a geographical standpoint, it's easy for us to try. Or we don't have that great distances. So everything's tied in. If you're in Copenhagen, you've got like, 40 schools around you so you can easily get those extra classes so it's not a big not a big issue but you have to remember that everything is tied in in Denmark everything is tied into wanting you to get to that next level we don't have separate educations or anything else everything is tied into once you went to I mean primary school then it went to another level another level everything is tied into each other so we know exactly where you're going and you have counselors already from eighth grade that's gonna come and talk to you and say listen if you want to do this you have to do that and blah 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 so everybody knows exactly where they're gonna go and they have that's, the right education that's brilliant we don't have that going on we don't have that's, that going on I, yeah. I i almost think that the quota system Tanner is completely different here. We want to yeah. see our kids go. We want to see our kids go to college and have three hundred thousand dollars worth of debt at the end of four years to go get the high school education that we didn't give them. Now, oh, mm, don't get me started. Go. Don't yep. get me started. I, yeah. I I just toured last weekend Harvard's campus, and I can see where the money is spent now. That was one, <laughs> that was one of the coolest things I got to do, and I am very jealous of everybody that got to go there. I would love to go there and take classes. They have a phenomenal campus. And, and you're going to have to remember one thing. There's no – you cannot privately donate to a school in Denmark. You cannot. Wow. It is illegal. So wow. any, if I want to go to my kid's school, uh, we have foster kids, but if I want to go to my kid's school and go, listen, I want to sponsor a whole new wing or whatever, 
no, that's wow. not going to happen. You can donate to mm. whatever you want to donate to, but you cannot. No, no, no. Uh, no legacy. Buy. No legacy. No legacy. Oh, not my. for me, at least. Let's go back to one other thing. I'm listening to you guys talk in this change of curriculum in the English science and math. And I wrote down these words, soft skills. And unfortunately, a lot of our young people are coming out of college not even knowing how to write a check. Not that it's important anymore or to build a resume or to how to have an interview. And these yeah, are all kinds of soft skills. And I, and I think we need to figure out how to get back to that or at least engage in it. All right. So I've got an exercise. Everybody is going to do this with me. This is something. Right. So I had to take a AAS degree. So I had to take a course called interpersonal communications. So Carm and Michael, cross your arms. Okay. Now cross them the other way. Feels weird. Now, <laughs> now we have to talk about a topic and you have to stand here like this with your arms crossed a weird way and try to hold a conversation with somebody. So I'm going to ask a question. Carm, your teachers that are at the college that you're currently at or that you're currently on the advisory board for, how were they chosen? Do you know? I have no idea. It's a great question. <laughs> <laughs> They're in the union. <laughs> Michael, the school that you were helping, any idea how the educators were picked there? I'm sure they just apply and then they get the job more or less because nobody wants to be a technical trainer anymore. So uh, I guess it's fairly simple to become one, and, uh, at least if you're a technician. But yeah, so uh, or a trained automotive technicians. But yeah, that's not how it works. So yeah. Okay. You both passed. I'm, you can uncross your arms. I'll go back on the fact that we are constantly looking to hire people and they've got to have themselves a, a decent background yeah. in automotive, had worked as a technician or shop owner. We're looking for all kinds of part-timers, but we still don't pay anywhere near what a red-blooded mechanical or technology specialist can earn. And I mean, that's one of the biggest gaps we have. Yep. Ag well, well, agreed. No, but I think what we're, what we're seeing right now is that people go, I mean, people actually or mechanics go work for technical school because it's an eight to four job or eight to three. They're tired of working late. They're tired of not knowing if their weekend's going to be tied up at the workshop or not. So it's to get the family life to work. And I do know, I fully understand that Denmark is an extremely rich country. We're extremely lucky that we have a high living standard. But for us, family values are way more important than earning that extra buck or getting that next BMW, pause, bigger house, bigger boat or whatever. We're going back to basics saying, listen, I want to spend time with my family. I want to be with my kids and be with them. So I don't look back when they're 18 and leave the house or 21. I didn't spend time with them, but thank God I've got two BMWs and a Mercedes. So I should be damn happy. Nobody, well, they go back and go, but we're not happy. We want to spend time with the people that we do care about. And this is a trend we're seeing. I actually had a conversation last week with a with someone in Denmark saying, listen, this we can't even pay them more. They won't stay longer because they prefer to go back home. We cannot pay them $10,000 or $20,000 more a year and get them to stay. They would rather just say, nope. I'll stay at my eight to four job and I'm not going anywhere because I'm happy with coming home, making dinner, having dinner with my kids, driving them to soccer or whatever. It's a different priority now. And I fully understand that. Yes, we have different opportunities in other parts of the world, but that's when you have a fairly rich society. Money is not going to buy you. There, there will be a certain amount of people that will do that, but nope, they will go back to saying, Hey, enough is enough. I mean, heavy having a better work-life balance. But that conversation takes place because, back to what Carb just brought up, the communication skills. They're willing to have that conversation, willing to sit down and say, okay, what is working? What isn't working? Are, is it changing generationally? Is it changing societal? You know, how is, why are the changes taking place and what can be done with them? What is the right thing for industry? What is the right thing yeah. for school? Well, well, just look at me. I mean, I used to travel 300 days a year. I mean, it was great. I loved it because I felt like this is what I had to do. There was no other way to do my job. Then I met my wife and she went, if that's the way you're going to do it, we're going to be divorced within six months. And I went, okay, maybe I should change the way I look at things and kind of do things differently. And yes, my work life, work 
private life balance is way better now. It's not as good as it should be, but it, it's getting way, way better. But I also have to understand that I'm 50 years old now. If I want to appreciate the time that I have with my family, this is now. This is it. In 10 years, they're, they're not going to be here. I'm sitting in this big house on my own. It might have been fun traveling, but what was it worth? Nothing, absolutely nothing, except for the fact that I have great friends all over the world. But it was just work. So that balance has to be in place. And I think for someone like like us that does travel, I mean, no matter, especially in the U.S., you've got to be careful because you're going to burn your fingers if you don't wake up and realize, okay, there has to be a balance between all of this. And that's also where we have to teach these kids uh, and say, listen, I mean, you might want to be progressive, want to want to be aggressive, make money, but listen, you can still make a pretty good amount of money and still have a normal life at home. Of course, everything is a sacrifice, but there can be a work. I mean, there can be a balance between work and private life. Tanner, you've done such a great job of asking all these great questions. And I know there's in the remaining minutes, and I don't know how many, we can have 100 remaining minutes. But one of the thoughts that you had coming into this before we turn on the microphones was about the different style that the trainers bring between Europe and the U.S. and the different technology platforms that they use. I'm interested in that, Tanner. Yeah. Those that know me know that I used to work for WorldPack as a training manager and used to help with developing content, not only my own, but other trainers, uh, and got to work with other companies. So that's how I met Michael and had got to look at all of the training content that Nissan's had done and the training content the ZF has done and all these different companies. And in the U.S., most of the time, we'll use PowerPoint, and the PowerPoints are kind of static. Sometimes there's videos in it, but very few and far between. And then sometimes if you are a ATMC accredited training organization, you will have questions at the end of testing to answer or to have the students answer. Looking at the way a lot of the European companies do it, the curriculum is a lot fancier and looks a lot nicer. The slides look a lot, or let me back up. They're typically not using PowerPoint. So when you get a slide stack from Nissan's or from any of those companies, they look so much nicer than ours and they're all professionally designed. Michael, I, do you guys have, is a, I, I know you said it was a design person, but the person that does that, what would be their like job title? They're just a designer that we support technically how they, it should be done. So basically, we tell them what we want to have created. We show them sort of schedule or sort of a markup of what we want them to do. Then they do it. And then we tell them where we want this to be interactive. We want that to work this way, that way, and so on. But I have to be honest, we've been very lucky finding a creative person that's very good at doing that. But you also have to remember, if you're a good PowerPoint developer, and I'm not. So I'm so lucky that I have a marketing department that are great at that. So even a PowerPoint presentation can be interactive. But the problem is that usually it's someone like us that does it. And I'm not a PowerPoint guy. Well, I am, but I, I'm not very good at creating them. But the problem is it lies on me to create it, meaning that it becomes very static if I have to do it. But once a creative designer or marketing person does it, suddenly they see it from a different perspective and we need to be entertained. Honestly, we're doing a show, putting on a show. So the canvas has to be interactive or entertaining instead of being just one slide where there's a, a thousand million words on it and you go, this is boring. I mean, I've been at those training classes. Michael, I love it. I love what he just said, Tanner. He said the canvas. And, and in my mind, that's the picture, if you will, that speaks to you. Yeah. Yep. Looking at how their content is designed, not only from a design perspective, but also from a learning perspective. And this is, I was trying to remember the name for it. And I didn't know. If, that's why I asked Michael. I didn't know if they yeah. had somebody with this occupation, but it's basically like educational design. So not just the graphic, but how the education content should be laid out, the order in which it should be laid out, the questions that you should be trying to answer, basically creating an outline and then making sure that what your outline is going to a answer the questions that you're hoping to answer during the class but then also that it's content that's needed in a certain education space so i don't know a ton about this don't know what it's called or what the like career would be called but there's people that basically build learning management systems or that's a great education point systems i 
don't remember what the degree is. I think what you're saying is you don't need a graphic artist. You need someone who knows how to get that data interpreted over into the student's mind. Yeah. Mm. Yep. Like educational design process from, I don't know what it's called, but at any rate, they do a lot better There's an art to it. There's just an art to it. (laughs) Yeah. They do a lot better job, in my opinion, most of the European companies that I've worked with do a lot better job of doing that, organizing content, making the content really nice looking. Karm brought up that he's colorblind. And like, I feel like a lot of that is thought through more so than what we do and what a lot of the trainers that you may see at a conference that we go to. If you go to Nissan's or you go to ZF or you go to Vallejo, a lot of those companies, Nissan's had a learning management system online with interactive learning and testing Mm. before many other companies in the u.s so that was something that they had always thought through i feel like and technicians there and students there were taking advantage of far before we were in the u.s so we have gotten there but i feel like we i would say also that i feel like some of them could have looked at things that nissan's and others did and learned from them instead of trying to design from the ground up but there's a lot to be taken from sitting through uh, Nissan's class or other class that was developed outside the U.S. because of how everything is organized in a what it looks like, what is being taught, and why it's being taught. There's just a lot more that goes so, into that. So I, I've got to say something, which Tanner, I think you've been one of the guys at a conference. You said, "Well, yeah, I got to do a class tomorrow. I got to go up to the no, I can't have a drink tonight. I can't go out. I've got to go out and tweak something. I just thought of something. Got to fix my slides." So many of our U.S. trainers have their own, this is their deck, these are their slides. It is a living, breathing organism. Now think about Michael. Michael's got this support person and he goes, ooh, I need a change on my slide. Does it take two weeks? <laughs> what happens? Sure. I mean, the only problem is you cannot be that impulsive. I mean, that that's the only uh, issue. You cannot yeah. be that impulsive. And but you have to remember, this is not my training deck. It's all of my trainers' training deck, and we all use the same. Nobody's allowed to do anything else because we want to make sure everybody gets the same knowledge out there. That's so important that we keep it so that yes, I can tweak it if I'm in Atlanta or I'm gonna be in in Rana's tomorrow. Or I'm gonna be in Copenhagen. Blah 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 blah. You know. Yeah, you're right. To the point, think about Ryan Coyman with Standard, right? Ryan probably has these decks for all of his trainers, and they need to be corporately solid. In your case, being an independent individual, and there's a lot of you out there, you're constantly improving. We have the corporate support structure that Michael has. We have the other thing that Standard would have and all these other large companies, Napa Training, the deck's got to be universal and right. And then we have the creative independence like you interesting listen i would pay somebody to make my slides look like nissan slides do though because they look way better than mine all right let's talk about that later (laughs) (laughs) one of the things that i want to come back to because i kind of got us off topic with my exercise about soft skills (laughs) in interpersonal communication so the exercise that i made you guys do was something that I was made to do on my first day of interpersonal communications class. Interpersonal communications was something that it was a college elective, but it was something that we got forced to make through the Toyota T10 program. And it was probably the best college course that I ever took. So we walked in and the lady made us all stand up and do that exercise with crossing our arms. And then was like, all right, now talk to the person next to you on the very first day, the very first class. So you didn't know anybody next to you and it was the most awkward feeling in the world and she's like all right everybody passes sit down she's like so that's what the rest of this semester is going to be like every day i'm going to make you talk to people in uncomfortable situations about uncomfortable things so that you learn how to communicate with people no matter the situation you're in i have talked to so many people and no other automotive school makes anybody take that course and that is something that is so needed in our industry is a communications course. So I have no idea if that is uh, something that is done in other countries, but well, there are in your school, you need it. Yep. Yep. They're out there. Sarah Frazier and Tracy are doing one at Asta this year. And we just launched a brand new podcast called speak up from Craig O'Neill, effective communications. So we have seen and recognized this. I think the industry is waking up to that whole 
need for better communications front to back, up and down as leaders, out to, to in to your clients. I think we're on a really big push with communication and service advisor training right now, Tanner. Yeah. I have another guy local to me. He does communications training, Not doesn't have anything to do with automotive. And I think one of the things that he does that was so cool is he will, uh, so he coaches people one-on-one -on -one and he will take them to downtown Greenville and just make them walk up to strangers and start talking to them and explain to them that they're in a communications course and that they have to do this, but he just makes them go up to people. And for like a solid week, <laughs> they have to learn to talk to strangers and he'll do it with people that have no desire to talk and are just yeah. very shy people to get them to learn to talk. You know, I think Michael's that kind of guy. He's never met a stranger, right, Michael? <laughs> I've never met a stranger. Are there any strangers in the world? Oh, we are just all friends and have a good time. Yeah. Nope. Yep. Yes, I'm going to try that. Nope. Yeah. This was a, a fascinating, fascinating. We, we, I have to tell you, we went down about four rabbit holes. This was fun. <laughs> <laughs> we did. Final words to my friend over the pond, Michael. Yeah. Well, at least this time I didn't go through any marriage counseling uh, or whatever <laughs> marriage. Uh, yeah. I mean, we had some yeah, marriage advice you, at last yeah, time. Just go right, type in Michael on my website and listen to all his stuff. He's done. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and, uh, You'll get so no, the only thing I want to say is just keep going to training classes. And honestly, it you can only become more clever. And, and there's so many courses and so many things out there you can learn from. And it's just great that you come are willing to do this and you ten as well. I mean, promote it. I mean, do as much as you can because we need it and all the students need it. Some of them don't know they need it, but they do. So whether it's in Europe, whether it's in China, whether it's in, in the U.S., doesn't really matter. Get out there and get some people trained. That's what it's all about. So main thing is for colleges and high school education centers, listen to this. Think through some of the things that might be done differently. Look at what takeaways you should implement. And think about if you are a large company like Nissan's or other, what you can do to help your schools, whether that be high school or college. Think about how you can get involved in the long term and what you can do to help. Boy, you know what? That prompts me to think about doing an episode on that and not just setting up your equipment and not just there's so many more ways. I know that the colleges, they're starving for industry to get involved with them. So thanks. Thanks so much for bringing that up. This was great, guys. Tanner Brand, president of Auto Diag Clinic, LLC, and it's an incredible trainer in the industry. Thanks for bringing me and this whole idea that you and Michael had talked about a while back. And Michael Invartsen, Global Training Manager, Nissens from Denmark. Thanks for being on. And, you know, I know you're usually sleeping by now, but it's 11 o'clock at your place at night. So thanks uh, for being here. Thank you. Welcome. Anytime. It was a pleasure.